so uh, this is KMS Dbot Deconstructed or uh, Dissected. I kept changing the name, I wasn't sure. I thought Deconstruct would be more like a food thing for French because I know the food is excellent here. Uh, well, let's see, introductions. I'm Larry Cashdollar. Um, I worked at Akamai for 22 years. Uh, I originally was a vulnerability researcher back in the late 90s, early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, I found a lot of security holes uh, back then, and uh, so many that MITRE gave me my own uh, CNA, so I was a certified numbering authority, so I could just give myself CVs and sign them myself, because they got tired of me asking. Um, I've been a member of Akamai CERT for the last seven or eight years, and um, I've recently gotten into uh, malware, reverse engineering, and threat analysis. So I'll let Alan introduce himself. Alan? Yeah, hi everybody. Sorry I can't be there in person. Um, my name is Alan West. I've been at Akamai for about a year in total. Um, prior to being on the CERT team with Larry, I was an intern while I was getting my bachelor's at Northeastern. And um, then when I graduated, I joined Akamai CERT and I've been a member ever since. Uh, what I do on the team is pretty much honeypot development and threat analysis. I've also been diving into malware reverse engineering. Uh, with Larry most of the time, <laughs> and um, I'm currently working on my master's in information security at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, the only reason I'm remote right now is because of complications with my password changes, so I could be there. Yeah, uh, Alan's been trying to get his password for six months, so uh, it's not his fault, it's, I blame it on the U.S. Uh, government, so... Uh, so points of interest, you know, stuff I wanted to, to talk about is um, uh, I originally discovered this botnet while I was testing some uh, new honeypot. Uh, the honeypot that I was testing was written in Golang. I was having some trouble with um, Calry honeypot, which is written in Python. I noticed that the Calry honeypot was truncating binaries after a couple of megabytes. So I was losing all of these nice chunky pieces of malware that were written in Golang because you'd go to, to examine the, the malware and it was only half there because the, there was something wrong with the Python library that was killing the connection and dropping it when only you, know, you had you know, seven or eight more megabytes left to download. Um, so I decided to, to try out this new, um, this new honeypot and uh, I noticed that it was um, grabbing these logs and interesting things and we'll get into that. Um, one of the things that we noticed with this botnet is that command and control structures in clear text, um, which made it a lot easier to reverse engineer. Uh, I wrote some code to emulate the malware client so that I could talk to the C2. And um, then I modified the malware myself to talk to our own C2 so we could direct commands and analyze the attack traffic, which I gave Alan the job doing because I figured he should have some fun. Um, and then Alan began fingerprinting attacks, which is what he'll talk about. Um, and then uh, one of the fun tidbits is that the malware actors actually crash the botnet themselves, and we'll get into that too. So first, infection. So initially, there's a script that runs that is uh, a simple uh, shell script, and you can see where it, they try a bunch of things, uh, wget, curl, tftp, um, let's see, there's another one, an ftp get. I've never seen ftp get before. So uh, I, they are pretty desperate to get this downloaded um, and just sort of threw a bunch of stuff at the wall and sort of would see what would stick. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the pieces I saw in my logs that I thought was pretty interesting in the new, the new honeypot. Um, let's see. So here's a downloader script. Um, I'm not sure why they did this in PHP. I assume they're familiar with it uh, more than shell script. I would have preferred they wrote it in bash or something like that, but they wrote it in PHP. And uh, I don't know, it didn't make sense to me because um, not every machine is gonna have PHP on it, but a lot of machines have bash on it. So I don't know why you would gamble with that, or at least write it in something that might be on the machine like Python or Perl or something, but they wrote it in PHP. Um, so the command and controls protocol um, it's over TCP. Uh, it uses a high numbered port to connect to. Um, it uses a null byte to initialize communication with the command and control server. 
So when the malware connects to the C2, it sends an OX00, and then the C2 responds back with an OX01, and then the heartbeat, uh, the malware sends an OX02, and then the C2 sends back an OX01. Pretty simple. And then the attack commands, those start with an exclamation point. Um, and then uh, because this was so simple, it was easy to, to craft a script that would, well, uh, craft a piece of code that would emulate this so that we could just track the attacks and um, examine what their targets were. Um, so in, in this piece of, uh, in this piece of uh, disassembled code, you could see, actually, I wore my contacts, so I can't see. Um, you can see where they, uh, they use the, um, they connect to the, the, the system using the IP address and the uh, port that they're, they're expecting, the number four, uh, four bytes of the string of OX00 and OX01, and then you see a further along OX02. Um, this was pretty easy to decipher, and then um, through detonating malware, because what fun is playing with malware if you don't detonate it, uh, I was able to examine the uh, TCP dump traffic and actually see the C2 talking to the malware and uh, confirm that this was indeed how the malware communicated with the C2. Um, and then further disassembly here, you could see the, the response code of OX02. Um, now, one of the things in Golang, which I'm not sure how many people are familiar with this, but bad guys are using Golang more and more because it's kind of convoluted to disassemble and examine for malware researchers because one of the things that it does is it takes all the strings in the binary and it squishes them into a blob and then it cuts that blob up. You know, normally if you're using like C strings, you have addresses of strings in memory. In Golang, there's just this big blob of strings and then the Golang software actually indexes into that string uh, from an offset and then cuts the piece out that it wants and then sticks that in memory. So this is sort of like a big ball of spaghetti that you have to index into to get the one noodle you want. That's how this is so. Uh, a lot of the um, malware guys seem to be switching to Golang to confuse us, but I'm actually enjoying Golang uh, reverse engineering myself more now. So, and then this is actually the the C2 um, disassembly where you can see the IP address of the command and control server. Uh, you can see where they're loading it into uh, memory, and then they're calling system net dial. Excuse me, system net dial, and they're um, connecting out to that server for the initial connection and then waiting for response uh, from the, the C2, uh, the OX01 heartbeat. So because the malware was easily uh, disassembled and examined, uh, I decided to modify the malware myself by editing the IP address that it connects to for the C2. Uh, this is what enabled me to, to pretend that I'm the C2 and tell the malware to do bad things on servers that I can control and um, not get in trouble for for attacking uh, my own systems. Um, this is pretty simple with um, Red Air 2, which is a reverse engineering software where you write uh, with the command WV, you can write the, using Indianness, you can write the IP address in in hexadecimal backwards, change the IP address to an RFC 1918 address uh, that is on my local network, and then actually spin up a C2 to emulate that using like Netcat, and then just wait with responses and, and um, send commands to the actual malware to, to direct it a target system. So now that I'm a C2, um, I can tell the, the, the malware to do what I want to do and target the things that I want to target and fingerprint the attacks. Um, and part of the, you know, fingerprinting attacks allows us to create profiles so that we can let people know, like our customers and general public on the internet, uh, this, this blog post that I had written, uh, or Alan and I co-authored together, was covered in media, and we had folks asking us, you know, how do I protect against this? And, uh, you know, what, what should I do to prevent, you know, any attack traffic coming from this system and directed at my systems in case, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a target of the attacks. So, you know, this really helped us telling them, well, this is what the attack looks like because we attacked ourselves with it. So it was kind of nice. And then um, 
I left Alan to fingerprint all the attacks because you know I wanted to share the fun and sort of push him into doing more malware research rather than building stuff to collect malware. And I'll let him do the discuss this part of it. You want to talk about this, Alan? Yeah, for sure. Uh, hopefully, you can still hear hear me all right. Yeah, um, we, can, we can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, like Larry was talking about before, with the complex Go strings and the way they store it in one big thread, uh, that became a, a point of difficulty when we were trying to figure out all the different attacks that this actually had and the commands to execute them. And so, what we ended up doing is we ended up um, infecting uh, a device and then basically waiting for commands from the C2 and then being able to track that in Elastic and have an entire index so we could see what kind of commands are coming in and uh, what, what sort of variables they had or arguments coming into it changed the uh, different parts of the attack. And what we learned from that uh, is in the bottom right, we can see the frequency of the different attacks uh, with big data being the most. Um, some of the very first attacks that I think Larry observed uh, before we did this was attacks on 5M, which is a custom GTA 5 embedded server um, hosting platform, basically. So you can um, you can host a server for these games, and uh, your, your friends can come in. You can play like all these different modded games, basically. And then they also had uh, a similar attack against uh, Red M, which is for Red Dead Redemption. Um, and then they also had a couple different attacks for HTTP, HTTPS. Um, those were post and Git, and those weren't as interesting because they were just basically trying to send polymetric attacks. Um, they were trying to blend in with traffic as much as they could, so they were trying to be uninterested, which you'll see in the demo we do next. And then uh, they also sent some TCP UDP. So you had the classic SYN floods. You also had a bunch of random data. Um, you had some that were hex, and then hex climb, which would uh, basically get larger and larger, and then jump down. And then uh, we also saw the communications keep alive from the C2, and we also saw scan, which would pull down a list of credentials to uh, brute force when they were looking for new uh, potential victims. And uh, so, yeah, we can move to the next slide. All right, so let's see. So this is a, uh, a sort of live quote unquote demo. Um, so we recorded this ahead of time. This is how uh, we were testing and benchmarking the uh, attack traffic. So you'll see on the left, we have a live TCP dump running. And then on the right, we have um, two panes. One is the communication back and forth in the C2. And the far right is the commands that we're pasting into it uh, to send to one of our infected nodes, uh, and then we're observing the traffic on the field. So you can see this is the most popular one. This is the uh, big data, and we're pointing it at add an address, add an uh, at a port number. And the really the, the big thing about this was that it just had like a big uh, amount of content within it. It was just a bunch of random data. Uh, They're just again volumetric. And then this is a similar demo of the attack. Uh, and this one is targeted at 5M. Um, this one is HTTP, which you'll see. And so we'll point it at the target again. Uh, you can see that the attack command structure is slightly different from the one previously. Uh, they kind of varied based on the attack. And so with this attack, there was a couple different interesting headers. You can see the content type is applications, which XWWW form URL encoded. Um, there's also like user agent is Googlebot news. Um, there's a couple of interesting things like that. Uh, you can kind of see the interaction it gets. Um, I'm not super sure why this is more interesting or more damaging to a 5M server than any of the other attacks, but it was also one of the popular that it received quite a bit of um, requests to attack. And 
And then the third and final demo we have uh, was just TCP hex. Um, this was not the TCP hex climb. And this was kind of an example of how um, most of their attacks were available in TCP and UDP. Um, and when we first started analyzing these attacks, um, a lot of them didn't really send anything of interest. It almost seemed like they weren't really implemented. Uh, in this case, you can see sending a good amount of hex data every now and then um, seems pretty infrequent and they don't, they're not sending at the same size each time. But yeah, and then they had the same capability in UDP that learned, and, um, and then they had the UDP and TCP hex climb, which would just get bigger and bigger in packet size each time. So, um, so yeah. And, uh, you can see the heartbeat going back between the C2 and the infected. And uh, in this case, we sent two commands uh, of TCP hex and ask the data that it uh, generated. Since mouse is getting touchy. Yeah, so just so just one more takeaway from this. Um, through observing the different attacks that were sent, we could also observe the different victims that were um, being targeted. And this tells us more about the client more than it does the um, for the author of the malware, because they were, you know, this is DDoS malware essentially. So um, people were paying them to attack. And um, so the popular targets we saw were gaming, he saw with 5M and Red M. And then we also saw religious sites, education institutes, there's a lot of crypto, different governments, obviously technology uh, and hosting of sorts. And then we also saw luxury car brands. And some of this um, luxury car brands specifically uh, also tied into gaming, whether there was um, you know, intellectual property disputes or any legal battle you would see pop up from that by people starting to attack them with various attacks. And then uh, one of the fun things that, that we observed was um, the bot authors did not put any error checking in for the C2 arguments. So uh, I was watching the logs one day and the uh, botnet authors actually crashed the entire botnet because they missed the space between www.bitcoin.com and port 443. So that one little space caused the client that I was running, the, the actual malware that I was running and watching the traffic, to um, crash and then spit out an error message in Golang saying, you know, not, a, not enough number of arguments. And, um, and the reason I knew what happened was I had the client that I had written in Golang actually running and logging everything, and I saw that the space was missing at the end. So I'm like, okay, they crashed their own botnet because of a typo, and um, the botnet got real quiet after that. For about 48 hours, it was nothing. And then after about 48 hours or two days, I started seeing them running the infector um, scripts again, where they were trying to infect machines and build more clientele or, or get more machines infected, build the, bot the botnet back up, and, um, and then uh, they actually crashed it again because they typed ls into the C2, uh, because it was the wrong terminal. So uh, this gave us, you know, an idea that they're using Linux um, to, to run the botnet from as a, as a control system, and um, they probably should be more careful where they type in commands. So the latest on KMSD bot now is um, it was offline in early January uh, till around, yeah, the 10th or so. And we were actively monitoring it still because we, we figured they probably would come back and, and they did. Um, they changed the binaries but only changed the C2 address in them. So they didn't make any updates to the binary. Um, and then actually recently in the last, uh, I'd say month or so, uh, it looks like they added some error correction because um, I noticed them sending a bunch of malformed commands and the client that, the latest client that they had sent stayed up. So uh, it looks like they, they learned from their mistakes or perhaps they read one of my blog posts and uh, they fixed the botnet. Um, so, um, you know, th this was actually, uh, Bruce Shiner actually covered this on his website talking about 
um, how software is, uh, you know, it's intrinsic to have error correction even if you're the bad guy. Because, you know, it, if you don't have error correction or, or, or error checking, it's going to bite you in the end no matter who you are. Um, and then these are some indicators of compromise. I can get you these if you want, like in text, so you don't have to write this down or take a picture of it and transfer it over because I'm not into torturing people. But I figured this would be just interesting to show what sort of names they've been coming up with. They've actually recently changed the names of the botnet to Watchdog because, you know, I guess they got bored of Kthread because, you know, another, another process name that we'll see in the process table that we'll just ignore that's taking 100% of CPU. Um, any questions? Uh, you can reach me on Twitter or Mastodon. Um, I don't know if Alan has social media set up yet, but maybe someday. I'm not sure. Alan? Uh, I could. Uh, I don't have any uh, Twitter for now. You don't have to. You know, I can. <laughs> I can. I can field questions through CERT, or whatever. But, but that's good. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Are there any questions? There, okay. I was I was going to say there won't be any lunch unless there's a question. But uh... Uh, sorry to delay lunch. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it could be a DDoS as a service, and it could be being sold. Do you know where it's being sold at? No, we're we're not sure who's buying or who's who's buying the service or the DDoS abilities because. You know, I could understand if they were specifically targeting games or game or game sites. It, I would think, you know, it's your angry 15-year-old. Uh, but I'm seeing religious sites being hit. I'm seeing um, technology companies, security companies specifically being hit. So I, we're not sure who's purchasing it, but it seems like someone is using this or selling the service of this to target sites because it's just it's all over the place. So. Um. Can you specify more in which uh, Anipod do we use to do that? You mentioned that you, you switch. Or, or yeah, I'm using one. I, the one that picked this one up is called SSH Syrup, which somebody wrote. It's written exclusively in Golang. I figured I'd give it a try. Um, I modified it some to, to my needs and my liking. And it, what it does is it, it emulates an SSH connection or an SSH server, um, and it Let's you can you can configure it to allow uh, any password to be used. I don't like doing that because I figure if a server is using any password, then you can fingerprint that as a honeypot because no normal server is going to let you log in as root with any password. So I I make sure that I when I set up a honeypot, I make it like root password or root root or something. I don't ever let it use a wildcard password. And this this lets you do that where you can you can change it to have either you know no password or any password or an actual password to make it more legitimate looking. And then it'll actually download files and store them on the system that the uh, bad actor might have downloaded. So it's, it's a highly interactive um, honeypot. Any questions? Hello, thanks for your presentation. I would like to know if you have any idea about the size of this botnet and if you were able to maybe estimate the impact of such attacks about the traffic generated by the botnet? We've been trying to figure that out, but we haven't seen them attack something with the botnet that we can s examine the traffic to. Um, I, so we have no idea how big the botnet is. And since they've crashed it so many times, we're not sure how big it ever was. So it's, it's been a mystery to us too. Um, I'm hoping at some point they hit something that I can see the traffic. Um, but at this time, we don't know how big it is. Any more questions? Last one. Hello, and thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, they were using Golang because it's a bit of, uh, in brackets, obfuscation. Yeah. Have you seen a uh, change to other languages where the compiler produces, let's say, again, in brackets, natively obfuscated uh, assembly? I haven't seen that. I've seen um, compiled Python binaries showing up, too, for malware. But I, I haven't seen, and I've seen a lot of UPX packed binaries, and then I've seen UPX packed binaries that have been corrupted, 
where the UPX headers are mangled or zeroed out so that you can't unpack it with UPX. And there's varying levels of that where uh, I've written a tool that will go through and try and fix a UPX binary based on some basic things that somebody might have changed to, to make the UPX unpack, un, un, be able to un, not unpack the binary. But then they just, they just sort of mangle more of the binary to make it worse to, to try and unpack it. So it's it's cat and a mouse game. So. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Terry.